After two black women music execs challenged leaders in their industry to pause promotional social posts on June 2nd, 2020, after the brutal killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, many of our Instagram feeds went dark as allies, influencers, and brands caught onto the moment and posted black squares to signal their support of the movement for black lives. Where do brands stand now, nearly a year after posting in solidarity with the global call for racial justice? We're gonna unpack that today. I'm Jacqueline Stewart, U.S. Head of Multicultural Communications at Edelman, and I'm excited to be joined by Unilever Executive A.C. Eggleston Bracey, who leads the personal care portfolio, including iconic brands like Dove, Shea Moisture, Tresemme, and Axe, and journalist Nick Charles, who is Managing Director at Word in Black and co-author of the upcoming book, Say Their Names, How Black Lives Came to Matter. And I couldn't imagine two better people to have this conversation with. So thank you for having this necessary chat. So over the past year, we've seen thousands of brands make public statements highlighting their commitment to eliminating systemic racism and advancing racial justice. AC, consumers have heightened expectations for brands to take a stand, not only externally, but also within their corporations. What hallmarks have you noticed in the journey for brands to become anti-racist, both inside their organizations and out? Yeah, first, thank you for having me, Jacqueline. I think this is a really important conversation. And um, I think now is the time where brands have to put our money where our mouth is. I mean, many, as you said, why we're here today is many brands have stood up in solidarity with the black community and have said Black Lives Matter. And now it's for us to take a look at ourselves and say, what do we do to help address an end systemic racism? And so your question was, what hallmarks have I seen? I've seen in the influx of that, brands doing exactly that. Um, I've seen brands have a hard look at themselves to see what are they doing to perpetuate the systemic racism that exists, like Angel Mama, like Uncle Ben, you know, making statements and making stances. And I think, um, you know, Unilever has also done the same. Um, I think it's important that a lot of our brands like Dove and Shea Moisture, et cetera, started on this journey before the inflection of the Black Lives Matter, um, I'd say recrescendo uh, back last year. But now it's, we have put our money where our mouth is, not just the black square, but what do we commit to and how do we continue on that journey to do our part to end systemic racism? Right, and I'm thankful that you brought up the word journey because so many different companies and brands are at different points in their journey. What do you say to folks who are really waiting for you know them to to get their internal house in order uh, to be able to then go out externally and tackle uh, the greatest ills of our society? Oh man, Jacqueline, there's so much to say about that. If we wait, we're going to be waiting forever. Because the reality is there's been four centuries of oppression. This did not happen overnight. What happened with George Floyd, it was there for the world to see, right? And so now we're all in it together, having a hard look at ourselves and what we need to do to change. So it's the time now to reflect and acknowledge where you are and don't let that stop you if your history is not one that you're proud of. From acknowledging that history and pledging to change. You don't have to wait. We've got to multitask, right? We've got to walk and chew, jump, chew, chew gum at the same time. I think I heard Nick say that we were talking and it's something that I say, you've got to walk and chew gum at the same time. We've got to multitask um, to get it done. And I think the other thing that I would say is to multitask, you've got to be authentic. You don't do this to look good. You do this because you're committed to the change so you have to acknowledge where you are, you know, and, and it's not easy. This is hard work. You acknowledge where you are, you commit to change, you ask yourself, your brand, where can you make a difference in this area? And every brand can have something different to contribute. You commit to that difference and to your point on journey, you take it step by step. You bite, take a bite of that elephant a bit at a time. You don't just swallow it to get to that end point. 
That's right. And we're talking about multitasking, right? And I don't think there's any sort of organizations or set of organizations that are multitasking more than members of the media. Um, They're both storytellers and brands themselves. So what role, Nick, do you think that they play in holding brands accountable for their commitment to driving racial justice? Well, first of all, I want to thank you guys both (coughs) for inviting me on this wonderful panel. Um, AC is incredible and Jacqueline's lovely. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I go back to the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement in the aftermath of the, the death of, of the killing of Trayvon Martin, who would have been 20 something years old now. And in that moment when Black Lives Matter movement was galvanized, and that was seven, eight years ago, if not more. And so it's been a slow process to see some brands come along. And we have a tendency, I think, as human beings and definitely um as corporations, as brands, as media, to normalize stuff. When we normalize things, it seems like it's okay. We just had four years of normalization, and look where we are. So the reality is we have to call it out. You know, one thing about brands, it's not just a brand that represents or produces a product, product, it's people. So the question is, first of all, get your house in order internally, and then maybe partner with organizations that are trusted by black folks and have always had the interests of black folks um, in their in their sites and as part of their mandate to make it seem authentic or at least to become authentic. If you look at your mission, if you look at your workforce and it doesn't align with equality, if it doesn't align with representation, if it doesn't align with diversity, if it doesn't align with equity, then you have an issue. And then you have to ask yourself, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt and not saying that you support white supremacy. But if it's agnostic about racism and misogyny and homophobia and white supremacy, where it's like, oh, we don't want to offend anybody, you have an issue. So you really have to do the self-inventory. You have to do the work internally. To AC's point, you cannot wait. And if you look around at brands and organizations, they are a young, talented ACs and Jacqueline's all around. Marshal those forces. Those folks were always qualified to be at leadership levels, at executive levels. You have to have them in the room when you're making these decisions. And speaking of decisions, you know, what impact does it have on on the media when newsrooms aren't diverse, right? We know that, yes, there are there is a growing cadre, an important voice, uh, Black voices in newsrooms, but there's just simply not enough. Um, what do newsrooms have to do to get to where they need to be in order to tell the stories we need to hear? Well, they have to acknowledge this, there's an issue in the, in the beginning. I think a lot of media organizations see themselves separate and apart when they in fact are brands, they in fact are organizations. Hey, it's five years ago, Les Moonves, who was the head of CBS said, look, the former president may not be good for the country, but he's great for CBS. And we went down that rabbit hole every day with him and to where we are right now. And so they have to look and say, what, are, what is best for the American people? Media is great at drama. Media is great at tension. Media is great, uh, great at telling you what's going on in front of you. They're not great at really dissecting the truth, explaining the truth, and they're not really great at letting you understand that this is materially affecting your life. They're not good at policy. What does this mean to you as an American? Part of the things about media is that there's media like Black-owned media, I'm the managing director of Word and Black, 10 um, Black-owned publishers. They are the most trusted people in their neighborhoods. They're the most trusted people in their localities, the most trusted people in their towns or small cities. Partner with folks like that. You don't have to go huge. You know, people want to make a big splash. But to AC's point, it's one day at a time, you know, step by step. You can't take one big bite and get all of it done. It's been going on for too long. So you have to figure out where are my strengths? How, as a brand, where I am, whether I'm a consumer package brand, technology, whatever, where can I make a difference and start there? 
So I often joke uh, with folks that it seemed like last year was the first time that folks realized that Black people existed, right? So we predicted that this year we would see an influx of products and initiatives uh, aimed at Black people that we just haven't seen before, just the sheer volume of products. Um, This past Black History Month, Apple released a limited edition watch featuring colors that reflected the Pan-African flag, right? And those are red, black, and green. Black Twitter, you know, immediately called out the brand for exploiting the movement for Black lives uh, for profit. What do you think big brands can do, AC, you know, brands that are the size and scale of Apple moving forward to make sure that they're not exploiting the movement and the culture, but rather authentically celebrating it? Yeah, I I think it starts first with the mindset and the mindset is to serve the Black community. And... um, I'm not sure that was Apple's mindset in this case, okay? And so the first thing you've got to do is understand and connect. You know, the brand building 101 is know the consumer. I try not to use the word consumer. I try to talk about people because I believe in human-centric brand building because we are more than consumers. There's one thing we do, which is consume products. The other thing is how we live and how we live our lives. So the first thing brands have to do is be in touch with the people that we want to serve. And out of a commitment to Black Lives Matter, that's a commitment to understand Black lives and what Black black people, men, women, children, communities need and want. When you understand that, you can understand where the needs are and how you create access. And then in doing that, we'd see what products Apple comes up with. I believe Apple's... um, new product, they're also a group of consumers or group of people who want to stand in solidarity with the black community. And perhaps that's what that initiative was for. But please don't be fooled by that. And then if you're committed to serve the person, what do the communities need? How many of our communities can afford a $500 watch? Of course, you know, I'm rounding up on the price. But, you know, anyway, that's your question was, what do we need to do. And what I'd say what we're getting wrong is trying to sell instead of trying to serve. And what we need to do is serve and then be rewarded with our growth based on doing an excellent job of serving. That's right. We've we've been counseling a ton of folks in the same way, right? We've been talking to clients across the spectrum who want to know, how do I show up? What is it that I can do uh, to really demonstrate uh, that I that I stand on the side of Black folks uh, during this movement? I stand on the side of equity and equality. Um, and you know, sometimes I get a little disappointed, right, when I find out that the aims for those initiatives is to make the news. Why didn't we show up in this roundup? Uh, of brands standing up for racial equity, right? Um, So Nick, if you could go first and give me a little bit about the media's role in shaping the narrative around brands and corporations, racial justice efforts. uh, And, you know, what is the answer to that, you know, for them to be trying to make the news? It is no, they want to be in a news cycle. Nobody wants to not be involved when things are being mentioned and especially in a good way and they're not being mentioned or they're not um, being included. But the reality is, take, you know, to AC's point, it's also a class argument. I'm not saying that, that tons of black folk who could un- afford that watch. Um, you know, but the reality is, how does that materially improve the condition on the ground of black folks and systemic racism around education, around health care, around police um, enforcement? What, are those, what is that watch going to do to materially improve that or even question those things? So, you know, it's great because the consumer who buys that, and if the person most likely is not black is wearing that, that's their, that's their total. That's their symbol, like, I'm down with the cause. No, the down with the cause is you're a technology company. There's a young man who just developed a, who recently developed a website where you can find out how to get a vaccine. Because the big problem about it is the inequity that we're seeing now about in distribution and access to the vaccine. So what does he do? He developed one that you can go on and find it in your neighborhood or find it in your locality. It's, it's basically New York based right now. People are clamoring for it in some other states and some other counties. As a technology company, that's what I'm looking for. If I do that, all of a sudden, it's not just the watch. It's all of a sudden I'm materially affecting communities by improving 
access to health care for those communities. And I'm addressing 400 years of disproportionate harm done to communities of color and black folks by health professionals. That's how you really make a difference. And the media has to frame it that way. But they want to frame tension. Oh, both sidism. There's no both sides to being not for white supremacy and being for white supremacy. There's no both sides in that. Mm -hmm. There's right and wrong. And I think we are at a point where people love the idea of oh, we America is divided. America is not divided. <laughs> on on in in Georgia and the election, the Georgia runoff and the election before that, African Americans showed that they were not divided. They are on the side of equity and representation and diversity. And they have white people who are on that side as well. White people are divided about those things. And what you see on the other side is what happened on January 6th at the Capitol. So you have to make a decision as a brand, you have to make a decision as an organization, and you have to make a decision as people in those organizations that promote and represent those brands on which side of that divide do you want to sit. That's right. AC, you want to talk a little bit about the media and, and folks' objectives to, to get headlines for their work? Yeah, I would just consistently say um, that's a challenge with marketers and brand builders because what we're trained to do is build awareness for our brands. And the new way of brand building, it's, um, in a purpose-driven world, is to have an impact, to actually help. It's not just to get headlines. And in the space of racial injustice and fighting for racial equity, it cannot be for headlines. Because if you try to make headlines, what people are gonna call out is what you're not doing. The thing with four centuries of oppression, there is more to point out that we haven't done than there is to celebrate what we have done. And so when you go for those headlines, all you do as a marketer and brand builder is open yourself up for what's not and the lack of authenticity comes through. So if I look at my brands at Unilever, everything we do is out of our purpose as a brand and our mission. And there's so much work to do in this space. There's so many areas of racial inequity. So my Dove brand is about beauty inclusivity. And so when we look at helping black women, because I'm a black woman, how do you help us black women? You know, we have a thing about our hair. You know, we've had issues on our hair not always being embraced, our natural hair texture not always being embraced. And then it's not just, you know, the issues of perception. There are laws that say it's okay for a school or any organization, a company to say you can change your hair. So we say, how can we help? So we formed the Crown Coalition to help. Crown creating a respectful open world for natural hair and partners like Nick mentioned that are like-minded, if it's the National Urban League, um, Color of Change, Western Center on Law and Poverty, to help. And so in that, we have the coalition help legislative officials drive awareness of the issue, and so in seven states, the Crown Act is passed. I give that story to say, it's not about headlines. <laughs> it's about having meaningful, lasting change in health, and that's seven states. So that means there's 43 states that it's still legal. So our commitment is not to stop until we have federal legislation passed and it's in each and every state. So for me, that's a case study. And I can go through eight of those case studies on different brands because not all my brands are standing for beauty inclusivity. They're standing for addressing other, well, of course, they're, they will be inclusive, but what they're standing for and advocating for are other areas of injustice. I love um, the public affairs angle, too. Go ahead, Nick. No, to follow up on what AC is saying, I remember Melba Tolliver, who was a local um, anchor here in New York City, and for years Melba wanted to have her hair natural. And she was told, no, that's not going to fly, that's not how the look is. And here we are post, the you know, into the 20th century, and it's only now that you have these laws passing, we're saying you can wear braids, you can have um, dreadlocks, you can wear your hair in a short afro if you want to. And that's part of representation, that's part of diversity, that's part of equality. And one of the things that brands have to, to, know, to do is like say, okay, you know something? I want social justice or racial justice to be part of my brand. I don't want it to be external to my brand. It's not an ad hoc thing. It's not an add on. It has to be part of the DNA of what we're trying to do as a company. That also sets you up for success 
down the road financially. It also brings you advocates in those communities that when somebody says, well, they're not doing this, your advocates are the one who say, hey, wait a minute, they're doing this. And we know they have far a long way to go, but the reality is they're trying. And I'll tell you something about black folks as folks who we always forgive, we always give you the benefit of the doubt, we'll build me back in the community when you stray. We will look at that and put that on the ledger over here on the positive side if you have if you understand that. And if you've decided that's how I'm going to go forward, I'm going to adopt that that policy, I want to adopt that attitude that social justice and racial justice is part of the brand that I'm selling. It's financially a good move. Societally, socially, it's a good move. I yeah. think next point there, and I'm sorry, Jacqueline, if you want to pivot to another question on what we call others say is really important. So when you stand in the work that you do to make a difference, there are others who can say for you as a brand what you're doing. And the other thing that I, uh, so I love that, Nick, on the other say, right? Because we earn the endorsement of others instead of try to pay for it. You know, which I think we've got to really watch out for because that's another trick that we do in marketing that we want to, yeah, that we want to change the rhetoric around. That's right. And you brought up legislation, AC and um, Nick as well. In talking about public affairs, you know, it's a very important to talk about the actors, like who are in charge of these systems and how they can change it. Because a lot of the conversation, whether it's about hair or it's even COVID-19, a lot of the onus has been put on black folks as if we are inherently born, right, with negative feelings about our hair or inherently born with comorbidities. And that's simply not true, right? These are the results of, of, of broken systems. So how are we sort of putting the onus back on the folks in charge of these systems to fix them? I think, you know, the, the, and I, I, I said this, I think, in a conversation with the two of you before. I am really saddened and devastated by what COVID-19 has done to our communities, but it has also opened up a window and a door to really f look at and examine the issues that got us to where we are right now. The reality, you talk about people saying, oh, you're just discovering black folks. Well, we as black people knew about health disparities. We knew about the support nationality disproportionately how we are affected by health outcomes and lack of health act access to good health. We also understand the disparities in education and all these things are playing out because of COVID, because it affects everyone, but it affects us even more. What we have to do, again, as I go back to this thing about normalization, we can normalize it because everybody, when the conversations you hear, and this is what media does, they interview somebody and they say, well, we want to get back to normal. Normal wasn't good for us. I don't want that normal. I want a different, new, more equitable normal. I want a normal where it's not disproportionately black and brown people dying because of a virus because they don't have good access to health care. And that's, you talk about, what does that take? That takes legislation. That takes pol policy. Who is materially doing things to improve that in our communities? So there should be not any rush to get back to normal, to belly up, uh, to go to the restaurant, to be able to be run around with no, any mask. You have to understand that this is affecting folks who look like AC and Jacqueline and Nick. And understand if you care about those people, you have to care about the communities from where they come. That's right. AC, are you seeing brands do anything specifically um, to address the actual systems that are perpetuating systemic racism? I think more should do something about the system because it's a system that gets here. And, um, you know, again, I would speak to my brands. The example that I gave on um, Crown Act is about the system, um, right? Because that's legislative. That is a system. There's another area you see what I see are brands making investments, making pledges and donations that hopefully put money in to change the system. What we have to make sure is we make those pledges that we put milestones and mechanisms in place so that funding can deliver the change that we expect because there's systemic issues. So that's one in terms of the system that there's just three things that I would say. The second thing that I would say is there's so many areas that need addressing. 
So if we think about why we disproportionately are impacted by COVID, it's because of the inequity that has been in healthcare. And so that's an opportunity for brands to address. I have two brands that are trying to address that. One of those is Vaseline, because what we see is 50% of healthcare practitioners and derms in particular feel like they're not educated about black skin needs and conditions. So when we have those conditions, we die disproportionately. So what we're doing is investing in education so that there's more awareness. Um, to address the issues. And there are a range of programs and things that we're doing. Another brand related to skin uh, launched a new um, skincare brand for melanin skin called Nele Skincare. And again, not to promote it, but to share what it's doing. Similarly, you know, people don't know who to go to for a black esthetician. And so we've started a legislative pledge to really, we started, um, if you go to Nele Skincare, you can sign a petition to make sure there's more equity and understanding and training when you are in cosmetology school, because you're not trained on brown skin and brown skin from Latina, from black consumers, from the diaspora need that attention. So that's an example. So that's within education and every area has that opportunity. If it's women entrepreneurs, if it's access to voting. So I believe more brands should, they're examples of that. Um, but we need to, I think, vote with our dollars and ask consumers to, as people who buy products, invest in brands that are making systemic change. You know, and, and what AC is saying is right. You know, in the last election um, in November, brands that supported the former presidents were called out. You know, people were saying, oh, you, you did you donate money to that? No, we can't stand with that. We'll put our dollars over here. Nobody had to say the word boycott. Nobody had to say, we're going to march and protest with signs. People just said, you know something? I'm going to vote with my feet. I'm not going to go to that store. I'm going to go to this store. I'm not going to buy from this chain. I'm going to buy from that chain. Because obviously the chains that are supporting those that person whose policies are detrimental to the African-American community is not somebody I want to be aligned with. And that's what, those are the calculations you have to make in this day and age. You know, Black History Month is, up, is upon us and will just be passed by when this comes out. But this is when they want to show up. No, show up all throughout the year. You know, the old black history is American history. But beyond that, really dedicate to figuring out, okay, all these issues that we have don't just cost African-Americans their lives. It costs the country potential. There's so much potential being lost because of not basically harnessing the excellence and the talents and promoting that and nurturing that and mentoring that in our communities. And it's the country's loss. And if you want to be a great country, if you want to build it back good, great again, you have to come to our communities and say you're making investments that are really important to us. Yeah. I think that's just something that needs to change, what Nick said. To, so I talked about being of service to the black community. There's another point that has a kind of like a tension in that, that this isn't just a problem for the black community. This is a problem for America and our future and our humanity. And so it's not just helping others, it's helping yourself and our country. And I think that's the opportunity in America is like, how do we make this our issue? So it's not studying the problem, it's being a part of that problem. Because, you know, there's a demographic shift, and even without the demographic shift, this is a scar in America. <laughs> We've done a lot of work to have to co correct that framing that racial equity is not community service, right? Um, it is not a handout to groups who are underrepresented. This is balancing the scales to increase innovation and improve outcomes for everyone across the board. Um, and that's what you get when you do advanced equity. You get better outcomes for everyone. It's actually holding us back uh, by having inequitable situations. You know, one of the things, you know, that January 6th taught me, and I, I, I keep telling people, look at the people who were at the Capitol and think about all the black, uh, black people who we have been disenfranchised and not thought to be part of the, of the American, um, to, to be truly Americans. And we toil and we join the military and we do everything. We are patriotic. And the most patriotic thing folks did 
or show up for the, for the general election and show up for, you know, even in mail-in battle, ballots, but showed up for the Georgia runoff. We were safeguarding democracy. On January 6th, we saw folks who did not care about democracy. It's big D, not small D, big D. And the reality is those who were, you know, the left behind, the court by Mali, you know, the, the, the stone that the, the, the stone builder discards becomes the head cornerstone. That's who we are. We are the head cornerstone, and you have to build on that head cornerstone, because despite all that African Americans have gone through, we, as much as we criticize, as long as we, as long, as much as we know, it's not working sometimes, we continue to march forward. Will that run out at a certain point? What? Will there be a certain point where Black folks say, you know what, we're not going to continue to try to safeguard uh, this democracy or continue to push for measures that we know folks are going to benefit from? Do you think that that's going to run out at some point? I Stacey Abrams is alive and has breath. I don't think so. Uh -huh. And there's a lot of Stacey Abrams out there because the reality is this is our country. And I, you know, this is our country too. And that's always been the tension that somehow we don't really belong. Mm -hmm. We're not really Americans. Immigrants come here and because of structural racism, racism, particularly against African Americans, they go ahead economically and all of a sudden they're white adjacent. So they think it, they're benefiting as well. No, the folks who really built this country literally, you know, the, the most poignant photograph after January 6th was the day after when they were cleaning up, it were black folks doing the cleanup of the glass yes. and, the, and the broken um, whatever wood and whatever else they had left strewn beyond after the domestic terrorists had left. We were cleaning up and reality was we built that capital. You know, our ancestors, uh, two, three generations removed, they built that. So no, I don't think African Americans will ever give up. They'll never stop criticizing. But you can't tell an African American anything about America because they know more than anybody else. And, and I guess, Nick, it's the point. We talk about one black community and they're just, while we are connected as a community, there is so much diversity in our community. So there are people who have given up. Like, why don't we vote at the same rate? A part of that is because we don't have access to voting. And others are like, the system doesn't work for me. Why should I participate in the system? Then there are others that are like, how can I not get, how can I not vote? Looking at what my ancestors did, how can I not? And as long as I'm living, I'm going to do everything that I can to fight for racial equity. You talk about St Stacey Abrams as an example. Mm -hmm. So I think we're always going to have a mix. And I don't think you will ever have 100% of the black community laying down or 100% of the black community saying, it's 100% of us voting, right? Because there's too much diversity in our community. Well, I think, you know, it's not just diversity. I don't think it's 100% of anything. But the reality is there are certain topics. I think Georgia is a, is a really great case study. There are black people, African-Americans, who showed up in that runoff election for Reverend Warnock because they thought the black church was under, under siege, because they thought his opponent was saying things that challenged not only him, but challenged the legacy of sure. Dr. King. And so you saw African-American voters in southern counties of Georgia where they are not the majority, but they overperform. We know Atlanta's going to show up. We know Cobb and Fulton are going to show up. Those counties are going to show up. But in the southern part of Georgia, African-Americans said, hey, you can't talk about my, my, my church like that. You can't talk about my God like that. You can't talk about my minister like that. And so there are ways to reach communities, to AC's point, who may have been on the sideline going, it doesn't matter, whatever we do, it's gonna be the same old, same old. No, what Stacy did, what Reverend Warnock was able to achieve is because people were like, we're gonna to try to make this change. And it's, you know, and with the folks who are trying to disenfranchise us, whack-a-mole, every time we turn up to try to hit us on the head again somewhere else, we just gotta keep fighting. There's over a hundred bills that, were, that are now pending to basically, you know, voter suppression in all these different states because they realize when motivated, the African-American um, voting force is so powerful. Yeah, they wouldn't try to stop the vote if they didn't think that we were that powerful. And in speaking about the diversity, 
you know, of black folks, do you think that brands are responding to that? Do you think that brands are responding to the fact that black people can be from anywhere? There's, of course, African Americans, but there's black immigrants as well, black Caribbeans, black Latinos. Are are they accounting for that? How is that showing up? And, and how has the movement advanced that conversation? As an Afro-Caribbean person who has been living here for since high school and went to college here, I the affinity between Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Latinos, um, Africans, and African-Americans should be a given, but it's not. Because I think there, again, as I said, immigrant groups who some, most of these folks sometimes belong to come here and the first thing is like, okay, well, I'm not going to search with African-Americans because they've been here for 400 years and look where they are. Not understanding the kinds of things African-Americans have had to go through. And not uh, not understanding that when they achieve something, they're standing on the shoulders of African Americans who gave their lives, who gave up their liberty, who risked getting shot to go to ballot boxes, who marched in streets for them to get the benefits they have now. And you know, one of the things I always say, like I was watching, and I think I was heartened by in during the protest movement of last summer, was that yeah, young people because they were young white folks and young Asian folks and young South Asian, South Asian folks who showed up because they get it. You didn't realize it's not, we can't just be us or they'll just stay home because they benefit from the system. If African-Americans are disenfranchised, if they're locked out, it makes us all the poorer for it. Mm-hmm. And we've touched a lot about, you know, on authenticity. AC, what questions do you think brands need to be asking themselves? before weighing in on these issues um, when it comes to blackness, when it comes to racial justice, what do brands need to be saying to themselves? Yeah, I think brands need to first reflect and say out of a commitment to Black Lives Matter and to ending racial inequities, what have I done to contribute to them? And that's a very mature conversation to have as a marketer, as a brand builder. So I lead beauty and personal care brands. And, you know, beauty brands a long time have established a um, standard for beauty where not all women, men, gender fluid were included. And certainly not, you know, black women with kinky hair, if we look at our history. So we've got to ask ourselves in our brands, What are those images I put out in the world? What can I be responsible for? Then when you own up, so that's a question. (laughs) What have I done to contribute? Then the flip side of that question is what can I do to help? And I have to stand in my brand's promise because not every brand has the same promise. Through that lens, when I talk about Vaseline that's committed to healing, how can I help? I have a brand, Love, Beauty, and Planet, which is, as the name says, it is about, you know, it's climate justice. It's about beauty and it's about environment. It's about environmental sustainability. Well, how can I help? How can I help? Well, there is climate injustice in our communities because we are living next to landfills. We're living next to factories. We have pollutants in our water. How can I help? So we're investing in a hundred, a um, hundred thousand dollar fund to help address climate inequities, you know, so that's again, an example. So what can I own and how can I help? The third thing I would say is so many times we think about what's going to help an underserved community or uh, if not underserved, uh, unacknowledged community, like the black community, we have to do it in a vacuum. Like there's specific special needs over here. So I need a big enough budget So I can serve the black community and I can serve the mainstream community because, of course, that community is all white. But we know today in 2021, that's not the case. You know, in America, 40 percent of Americans are people of color. So the mainstream is us included. So it's understanding how you can be of service to needs of people of color, but how you tap into needs of that whole diaspora and being willing to tell black stories and other stories, not in compartmentalized only to black media or in percentage of our budget, but as the face of our brand in total. And the brands that do that, and my experience has been over time, you know, when my brands have done that, we've been 
we made a difference for the black community and beyond and have been rewarded with growth. That's the third question that a brand should ask. Is this a need that I can serve more broadly also by understanding what's underserved in our community? You know, I think one of the things that AC was talking about is, let's take for instance, we over-index and we set the trends. When it comes to culture, it's African-Americans, music, dress, speech, the walk, the general attitude. Everybody wants to utilize it for their own benefit. Everybody wants to ape it. And it's always, I always joke that people love black people. They want to be, they want, you know, they want to utilize what we have. They don't want to be black, but they want to show up as black. Um, and so that tension AC is talking about between who the mainstream is, you go to a ball game, the performers, the talent, the cultural icons, African-American, the paying customer overwhelmingly is usually um, white or majority culture. And the shift has to be as the NBA more than other leagues, let's just take that as an example, has been pushing it forward. The NFL, not so much. You know, the NFL, Super Bowl, yeah, yeah, Super Bowl, a commercial about kneeling? Really, dudes? And Colin Kaepernick can't get a job? <laughs> and you have a commercial about now, it's okay, social justice and racial unity. That's the wrong, to use, use a phrase, that's the wrong tone. That's not going to get you any advocates. That's going to get you people going, get out of my face. Because that's part of authenticity. You know, because the folks who stood with Cap when he first knelt are the folks that we will defend and be advocates for. Nick, you just brought me to a question that I would add to AC's list, which is, is my commitment real or is this just window dressing, right? We have a lot of folks who are having to come to grips with themselves about whether or not they are actually dedicated to shifting things within their organizations so that they can then impact uh, the society in which they operate. And a lot of folks are going to find themselves at the wrong end of that of that check-in when it comes this year, when folks are looking back to say, what have you done in this year? You know, how far have you come? Have you changed anything? Well, on May 25th, which is going to be the one year anniversary of the killing of George Floyd, people are going to do an inventory and see what did you do? We know what you did right afterwards, what you pledged to do. And it's not just brands like AC are talking about. There are organizations that see themselves as social justice organizations, but are not really because in their own houses, they are not, they're not right with themselves in terms of having people of color, um, African-Americans at leadership positions, and they're gonna be called out for that. Because if nothing goes on, we're gonna keep having up upheavals. Unfortunately, and we know this, George Floyd is not gonna be the last black man shot by police or killed by police. And you he know, wasn't the first. <laughs> and he was not the first. Breonna Taylor is not going to be the last um, black woman, African-American woman, shot by police accidentally or otherwise. So what do we do to help prevent that? How do we show up in ways that that is more of an anomaly and not in itself a pandemic? Mm -hmm. And if, when we start asking those questions and when brands start realizing people will hold them to account, and we won't forget and we won't normalize, they will actually have to start coming up with better ideas and more authentic responses. And as people are holding brands accountable, AC, can you give us a look into what do you think brands are missing in their efforts to address uh, systemic racism? Yeah, I think this is what we talked about before. It is, we've got to move from selling to serving. And to serve, you have to understand. And I think brands need to do better at understanding, uh, really, really understanding and moving beyond the image of what we think people want and doing it, just as you said, to look good because of window dressing. The other thing underneath that, and I probably would add this to your other question, what should brands ask, is what are we committed to? And how long are we committed to it? You know, how I've been talking about the purpose of our brand now, and again, if I talk about Dove and I talk about the campaign for Real Beauty, it's not a purpose, it's our lives work. 
like as a, if you think about a brand as a life, what's our life's work? So what are we committed to? I think that's another thing that brands are missing. What are we committed to beyond beyond this moment? You know, we all say, is it a moment or a movement like Hamilton? It's a movement, but we really want it to be an enduring movement. And you can create an enduring movement when you have a true commitment. That makes total sense. I do want to touch on inclusion and diversity for a quick second, because, again, we saw we've been talking to a lot of folks who went straight to diversity and inclusion when it came to uh, addressing systemic racism. Is that a viable response? Uh, to the call for racial equity, um, and how far do we need to go uh, when it comes to DNI? Uh, I, I am going to be very blunt here. I think a lot of DNI efforts are, are nonsense. They're bullshit um, because they're not funded. They're not given the appropriate. So let's say we make someone the head of DNI. Is that person at the leadership level? Is that person? right next to the CEO or right under the COO, or is it somewhere on the org chart over here? Unless it's integrated into, as I said, the DNA of the company or the brand, it's never going to work. And the DNA, the DNA, uh, DNA the vertically inclusion um, DNI folks usually don't last that long because they realize they come up against what is structural issues in, in organizations that hold them back to do them job, do their jobs. And so, DNI, yes, we're going to do some diversity and inclusion. We're going to hire somebody. That person's going to get a nice salary. That person's going to get a nice little office. But the reality is when they bring out the first report that these are the changes you have to make internally and these are the changes that have to be made to how we promote and market our, ish, um, our brand, they're going to be like, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, because they're like, oh, that might affect our bottom line, not understanding that your bottom line can be enhanced by actually enacting some of these things. So... For me, I am not a big um, proponent of or a fan because I don't see the results as much as I'd like to. And knowing a lot of folks who are in D and I positions, I hear from them that I wish I could do more. And that's the issue. It's not, and it's not just about hiring one person. Just as you know, one person is not going to solve your brand issues if you uh, mess their brand. If you are aligned with if your mission is aligned in the wrong way, that one person is not going to help you. It takes more than just that one person. You know, people talk about, oh, oh, you know, we should hire a black head coach. Well, it's not just the head coach, it's the ownership. And where do we get black ownership? And, you know, when we talk about, and I I'm keep using sports because we over-index in sports, at least in the major sports, and they are big businesses. They're billion-dollar businesses utilizing African-American talent. And so diversity and inclusion is a good idea. I haven't seen a full maturation of that in a lot of brands. And I guess that's where I think we're better off with DNI than not. Because I would say the companies that have it, there's a conscious in that company. Even if it's one person, you know, one person can make a difference. Have the DNI organizations reached their potential to next point? Absolutely not. And is it a cop out if you only make the job to drive true diversity and inclusion, the job of DNI? That is not going to cut it. But the concept of DNI is what we need. You know, it's what we need. It's not enough to just have representation or tokenism. You need people that fully that are fully included that fully belong and are accepted and are able to unlock their full potential. And, you know, a good DNI agenda is about belonging. It goes beyond, it includes representation, but goes beyond to include unlocking full potential and impact, which comes from, which comes from diversity and full inclusion and the concept of equity versus equality that we all know, right? And then it goes beyond to make sure we're doing our job to have the impact in the community. So some of the best initiatives, DNI led initiatives, in my opinion, do that. And the best DNI leaders report to the CEOs. They're not reporting into HR just as a people function, but they really do integrate into the business strategy. So I can appreciate Nick's perspective. It's like, you know, I see too many DNI efforts that are not cutting it. So I am not a fan. 
But I'm saying we have got to hold the bar high and make sure there is a DNI conversation in the organization that there is a DNI, um, uh, uh, actually a DNI organization. Because I think if there isn't, it's too easy for these companies to have processes that are not inclusive. So they're at least the conscious, they're the system, they're the champion, but they can't be at it alone. You know, I, I did not use the word defund or the word ab abolish, <laughs> but I am just saying, and I guess AC is way more of a better of, a, of an optimist than I am. I'm a good journalist. I'm a pessimist. It makes for good journalism, makes for a bad dinner companion. But my rea my reality is, if in the org chart the I person doesn't sit at the heart in the middle of that organization, and to AC's point, reporting is directly above to the person who makes the decisions. Because at the end of the day, whether you have a board or not, there's one person who can actually say, this is how I'm going to do it. And I learned that a, a long time in journalism. I had an editor in chief in when I was in, in a newspaper, large newspaper in Ohio. And he went to his photography department one day, was in Cleveland, and he says, okay, I'm the editor in chief now. And every time you guys go out on Sunday and cover the Browns, the only photographs I see are, are white fans. That can never happen again in my newspaper. When you take photographs, he says, I know they're black ticket holders, season ticket holders, because I'm one of them. I want to see that, that representation in the newspaper. That's how things change. So yeah, that the, is, goes and says, this is to do it. That's a great example. And that's why I think our roles matter as well. So as a, a black woman business leader, Right. It's my um, I have the opportunity to highlight the business case for being of service to black communities. And in that, as a business leader, separate from a DNI agenda, it just makes good business. So we need DNI, I believe, and we need diversity in the leadership that's beyond DNI to drive that agenda. And we need, um, you know, what? the world likes to call allies, I like to call active advocates, that are also highlighting what the, the business case is. When I say the business case, it is through the lens of how can we help? And if we are helping, how we are rewarded with growth and profit. So I actually am not that different than where you are, Nick. It's just that I do think DNI has a role, but I don't think it can be done alone, which is what you're saying. You need the real game changers driving the agenda, making the agenda happen. You know, I love the one before, before we wrap up, I want to make sure that we do talk about, you know, you brought up AC, our roles, right? I do want to, us to t touch on our roles as game changers and how we've had to navigate this movement uh, and this moment as individuals and professionals at the same time. We've had to bring ourselves to the table. And first I'll start with AC and then I'll go to, to Nick. What has it been like to show up in your space uh, during this time? And have you felt any pressure to show up stronger? The word of pressure is kind of triggering for me because I would say if anything, it's more um, privileged to make a difference in the now. And to have the platform to make the impact is less pressure. Call it privilege, call it duty, call it committed and passion, in passion to make a change. That's how it's been for me. And it's at a cost because we know we armor up, right? To make it through. I've been in corporate America 30 years now, you know, so I've learned to armor up. And what I mean by armor up is have the tough skin to go in day in and day out and fight the good fight to drive the business, to advocate for people that look like me, to deal with microaggressions that exist you know, over the 30 years in the workplace and just get on with the work and then to deal with what happens outside, traveling internationally, dealing with customs, dealing with not being serviced properly in restaurants, all the stuff we deal with, we just armor up so we can do what we have to do. And a time like now, leading with armor is not sufficient to get the job done because you've got to lead with humanity. And so it's having to unravel that armor to talk about how George Floyd's murder hurt my 10-year-old son and to talk to him about it, to go out in the street 
and march with my daughter, who I wanted to keep home safe, who was thrown to get out there and protest, and to talk about that with my teams so that they get the reality and the humanity. That was my challenge when I would rather, because man, going from a Zoom call to to, to sell the donuts (laughs) to dealing with the pain you know, we were all dealing with it. That's not unique to us as black people, but it is acutely felt. That was the the pain and the pressure point that it was uh, really acute to this time on top of the need and privilege to be of service, like with our brands as the leader to help us navigate through these difficult times and to continue to keep the energy to fight that good fight. Oh, energy. That's the word. That's the word right there. Nick? You know, I'm lucky. I work and I chose to and I'm privileged and humbled to work for the Black-owned press. At this point in my career, I haven't done so many magazines and newspapers that majority own or corporate media. Two things I do. I have been able to to cleave together with my community of African-American family and friends and, and my allies, who I don't call allies, I call them disruptors. You know, my best friend is half Mexican, half Irish. He's a disruptor. Those are the folks I have to lean on in this day and age. I think um, it's important to recognize that, you know, the things that you might have taken for granted, and because you are, quote, unquote, people always ask, but that doesn't affect you because you have a great job and you have a nice house. And I said, don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted that it doesn't affect me or affect my family because I have a 13 year old who hopefully will grow up into a young man and do something great. And I worry about him and my eight year old, the same thing. And I try to take lessons where I can. And people always ask Bill Russell, the great, Um, Celtic basketball player, as a white person, what can I do? And Bill Russell always says, be kind to your wife and children, be kind to your family. So the example they see is your kindness and your humanity. Lead with that and a lot of things will follow. Well, I will let that be our last word. Thank you so much for your time today. This has been such a good conversation and I'm blessed to have shared the time with you. Thank you so much, AC. Thank you, Nick. And it was incredible, Nick and Jacqueline, to have this conversation with you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, bro.